Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not on. Is this on? Is the microphone on? Okay. I, I recognize that some of you are still eating the German chocolate cake or other things that you might regret tomorrow. But uh, before I introduce our keynote luncheon speaker, uh, I do want to take this opportunity to acknowledge some of the many folks that really were behind the scenes and put everything together to make a major two-day conference like this work and hopefully flawlessly. Uh, you've met some of these folks at the registration test, but let me publicly acknowledge and thank uh, uh, Doris Ann Kelly back there, Donna Gano over at that table, and Dana Norvell, who was also back there. And also, you've noticed that there was a young man uh, filming all our panel sessions. That's one of my students, Justin Early, and Deb Kinney back there from our technical staff at Duke has been filming all the uh, dining room sessions so that we would have an accurate video and audio transcript which will ultimately be posted on the Duke website. Uh, also, you, you notice that there were a couple of ladies that were moving the microphones back and forth for Q&A and those ladies are Marion Strand and, and my wife Bev, you see I get cheap labor by having them do some of this stuff. Marion is our neighbor. I ran out of money, so I had to use these. But anyway, would you join me in thanking these people? Our Friday keynote speaker is General Richard, Richard B. Myers, who only six months ago retired from the Air Force and from his position as the 15th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As the Chairman, he was the Principal Military Advisor to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Council, and by law, he was the nation's highest ranking military officer. General Myers joined the United States Air Force in 1965 after completing a Reserve Officer Training Corps program at Kansas State University where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. By the way, he also holds a Master's degree in Business Administration from Auburn University. Throughout his 40 years of military service, General Myers has commanded at all levels, not just in the Air Force, but obviously as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and has served in significant staff positions throughout the Air Force. His largest commands include United States Forces Japan and 5th Air Force located at Yokota Air Base in Japan and North American Aerospace Defense Command or NORAD and United States Space Command and Air Force Space Command all headquartered at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. General Myers is a command pilot with more than 4,100 flying hours, primarily in fighters, F-4, F-15, and F-16 fighter aircraft, and he has 600 combat hours in Vietnam. His awards and decorations, I would waste all of our time reading them. They take an entire page, single space, just to list. I would only tell you he's probably one of the most decorated officers I've ever known. Now, after retiring from the Air Force, and his position as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs only six months ago, General Myers is heavily involved in informing the debate on the issues that he knows all so well. And he's doing that in part with an affiliation from his school, Kansas State University and the foundation there, and also the National Defense University and its foundation. As with General Minahan yesterday, I had the distinct pleasure of serving with General Myers for a total of four years 
while we were both assigned to Tactical Air Command at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. And during the first Persian Gulf War of 1990 and 91, he was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Requirements for that command, an extremely important position when you're in war fighting mode. Ever since we met back in those days, I followed General Meyer's distinguished career with the utmost respect and admiration. And I'm so pleased that he could take time from a very busy schedule. You cannot believe how busy he is to come down, to be a keynote speaker for us, to come to Duke and to be at our conference. Please join me in welcoming General Myers. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I uh, appreciate the uh, kind introductions. Scott Thorne was always one of those that uh, was a voice of reason and logic and calm in what sometimes they really want this on. So, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, they said. Uh, so I thank you, and I thank you for the opportunity. And we have stayed in touch over the years, and it's nice to be part of something that uh, I know you think is important, and I think is important as well as I, I learn about uh, your activities down here. And I thank you, Scott. And my guess is we'll have more to do in the future. Matter of fact, um, you know, when, when generals retire, particularly four-star generals, there's always uh, a great deal of curiosity on their staff on how are they going to survive without all these folks to, uh, you know, take notes, make the phone calls. I mean, there's that old, I don't know if it's true, our historians would know, story about Eisenhower when he retired and he's got this assistant and he says, hey, this phone's making this funny sound. The guy listens, says, hey, that's the dial tone. Uh, <laughs> so there's some things, you, there's some things, is that a true story? I don't know, it's reported as true. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you my story where I knew that uh, I was now retired and I was no longer chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and that um, what influence I would wield would be um, done a lot more subtly than perhaps in the past. Uh, we moved from a very nice Army house to a, uh, on Fort Myer, the best residential view of Washington, D.C. there is, bar none. Anybody that's been there knows that. Uh, and then we moved to uh, the kind of house that we can afford in retirement, which is a little bitty townhouse. The, um, the townhouse is fine, with the exception there's no storage, so a lot of Mary Jo's things had to go. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> she's not here. It'll probably get back. Actually, a lot of my things had to go as well. So this necessitated several trips to Goodwill. And uh, here's my story. So I'm, I'm driving my truck over to Goodwill to, to donate some things. And uh, the trailers where you donate next to this, they have a wonderful building there in this one part of Washington, D.C. And, there's the trailers, and here's my car, and, and between my truck and these trailers is a Goodwill truck that's kind of blocking the, the little pathway there. And so I, and there are only two of us around, and I, so I lean out, and I said, um, could you piece back up just about two feet so I can get by? And the Goodwill truck driver says, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and I looked behind me, and sure enough, to my, in my defense, there was a faded a little white stripe on the pavement back there that showed me going the wrong way. But the question was, do I back up 50 yards or have him back up two feet? And so I tried one more time. I said, yes, I'm going the wrong way. Guilty, sorry, I didn't know. But if you could just back up two feet, I can get by you and I can do a U-turn Well, life will be good. He says one more time, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> Not good morning, how you doing? Just you're going. So one more time I tried it and I said, I know, I'm going the wrong way, guilty. If you could back up two feet. There's people behind me, there's nobody behind you, please back it. So eventually he does, I go around, deposit my stuff, and I'm on the way back home. And it's about noon on a Wednesday, and I'm thinking to myself, I've been out now three weeks. And so I was thinking, well, what would I have been doing on a noon on a Wednesday three weeks ago, or four weeks ago, or five weeks ago? Well, I could have been in the Oval Office talking to the President about something. Could have been briefing the Secretary of Defense. But no, my fate now is to negotiate and use all my talents and <laughs> diplomatic skill to get a good little truck driver to back up two feet. And I was successful. Felt pretty good about that. Actually. <laughs> but, so that's, that's when reality hits home and, and the strange sounds of the phone is indeed the dial tone and uh, we've learned a lot. Um, the last, uh, the, the 40 years career has been very fulfilling. The last four in, in uniform uh, particularly fulfilling, I think, because of the challenges that this country faced. And if you don't mind, I know you've talked a lot about some of these things. Uh, 
yesterday and today, and you'll probably talk about them this afternoon. But I'm going to I'm going to spend about 20 minutes talking about things that I think are important, and a little perspective, and I may throw some things out to be a little provocative, perhaps. You won't know until you ask questions. And then we'll go into questions. And um, we could have a rich series of questions. I know from the type of conference this is and just what's going on in the world that we could, we could spend the rest of the day talking about things. <clears throat> but let me give you <clears throat> my perspective on, on a couple of items. And uh, this is my point of view. This is Dick Myers. I'm not running for office. I'm not running for um, anything, actually. I'm just trying to get the Goodwill truck driver back up two feet so I can get on with life. That's pretty much what I'm into. Let me talk about the threat that this country faces. There was an article today in, in one of the papers that talked about, you know, people really aren't focused on the threat from terror anymore. They're focused on immigration or Iraq or whatever the issue of the day is, or fuel prices, uh, energy supply, but they're not focused on the war on terrorism. Uh, I have said for a long time, while in uniform and out of uniform, that I think the threat from violent extremism is the greatest threat this country's faced to our way of life and perhaps to our democracy since the Civil War. Provocative statement. But I, and I believe it, and here's why I think it's true. In 1998, Osama bin Laden declared war on this country and on our way of life. And in subsequent, in previous and subsequent writings and utterings, they stayed it time and time again. And that's sort of the Sunni branch of irreconcilable uh, Islam. There's a Shia branch, as you know, as well. Um, which up until uh, uh, the September 11th actually killed the most number of Americans um, of, of violent extremism. Uh, the reason I say that is because the methods they use are not armies and air forces and, and navies. The methods they use are terror, and terror is meant to instill fear in us. And when we are afraid, then we act in ways that aren't logical sometimes without optimism. It was President Roosevelt that talked about uh, the four freedoms in 1941. One of them was the freedom from fear, because he understood the power, uh, as fear grips your mind, the power it has over our ability to act in a rational way. That's why I think this threat is so, so severe. And if you couple that with the fact that they would, and have said that they have a grand plan for, for the world, and they start small, but they go big. If you've ever been to one of their websites where they talk about uh, their goal, now I'm talking about Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden in this case, their goal is, is, a, is a world where people are under the kind of regimes that they favor. And they start, they start fairly small, and you know, small being from Indonesia up through the Middle East over through North Africa. But they get real big, and if you go out 100 years, you look at a map, and they color everything on their map red that... Uh, they think will be under their sort of um, view of the world. And North America turns red, interestingly enough, in 100 years. I mean, so they take a long view, and they're at it, and they're willing to kill anybody, anytime, and act as basically uncivilized folks uh, trying to, and barbarians, if you will, in achieving their goals. If you think back to 9-11, and you think about how uncertainty and perhaps fear gripped our minds, and and you look at the repercussions, uh, whether it's economic or whatever it is. We were in, uh, wife and I were in Italy last year for our 40th wedding anniversary. We were in a little bed and breakfast, a place that I thought would have been untouched by 9-11. And the proprietor one morning, we were up, he happened to be uh, an American. Actually, the proprietor was his wife. Uh, he was uh, the one making our breakfast. And I was trying to get an extra cup of cappuccino out of him. So I was engaging him in conversation. And I just said, um, how did, uh, how's your business? He says, well, finally, uh, we're back to the level we were after September 11, 2001. Here in Tuscany, a little bed and breakfast that only had four or five rooms was impacted that way. And of course, that, that spread around the world. And I think that's that fear, that uncertainty, that lack of optimism, that drawing in a little bit, um, trying to protect ourselves. So I think this is a very dangerous threat. And I don't think we talk enough about the big threat. We always want to focus on the tactical issues, which are interesting and important to the big threat, but they're not the big threat. And I think the further away we get from September 11th, the more we're going to forget that. I am absolutely surprised we've not been attacked again. I do think uh, the actions over the last several years have helped uh, thwart attacks, but it's like the, the fellow you see on the street corner and you say, what's your job? My job's to keep the elephants away. Well, there are no elephants around here. See, I'm doing a good job. 
So, I mean, you, you, know, you don't, to prove a negative is very difficult, but I, and we have some evidence, we have some pretty good evidence. So I think, I think we're safer, but we're not done. And that leads me into the second part. So if that's the threat and that's so serious, what's the strategy? Um, I, can, I can still remember the, the, the night that President Bush returned to the White House after September 11th. And um, it was a meeting in the Situation Room down underneath the White House, a place where I've only been about two or three times. And you got to go through some corridors and stairs and stuff. And I don't really remember how I got there. And I probably couldn't leave, leave back there today because it's not where you normally meet. But it's where you meet when you think you're under attack when you're at war. And I remember the, um, the countenance of the president as he walks in the room. Uh, he was very concerned. I think he, I, I, well, I think, it's, I think he's probably said it, but I think he felt that I'm the commander in chief, I'm responsible for securing, part of my responsibility is securing this country, and I failed. And that was kind of the look on his, on his face. And he said some remarkable things that night. One was, which is leading to the strategy talk I'm gonna get into is he says, don't know, by then we knew it was Al Qaeda, but that was, we hadn't thought about next steps yet. Uh, that's what we were there to talk about. But he said, uh, I don't know where this is going to lead us. My guess is it's going to lead us to do some things that will be very unpopular with the American public. And he says, we're going to do what we think we need to do to secure this country. And if that means it's a one-term presidency, then that's the way it's going to be. And you all just get used to that because we're going we're gonna to be we're gonna be bold. So the strategy as it evolved was realizing that against this threat, you can't build although the airports try to screen us so we can't do bad things. But you can't build walls or put enough barbed wire on things to secure yourself. In other words, a good defense is not enough. There's got to be an offensive component. And you saw that first play out in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the things that was different about Afghanistan than previous attempts to send signals to the Al-Qaeda that were really serious about this. I mean, after the uh, East African bombings, uh, USS Cole, um, other events, you know, the, the, the typical response was, and remember, I was the vice chairman under President Clinton and the chairman under President Bush, which is usually a question I ask people, a little civics lesson, you know, are your generals political? We're not supposed to be, but I mean, do you come and go with the presidents? And about, the audiences get it about 50-50. Some think, well, sure, you know, if you're, you go, go or come with the president. Well, it's not true, clearly. So I have some experience with these previous um, reactions to terrorist acts. And they were always perceived by the Al-Qaeda as being weak and ineffective. And you could probably argue in some cases uh, led them to be even, even bolder. But in Afghanistan, we wanted to make a statement very early. And you may remember, um, or you probably don't remember, but uh, I raised my right hand, took the office of chairman on 1 October. On 7 October, we're in Afghanistan. And then shortly thereafter, we put boots on the ground in Afghanistan in a very major way for a short period of time. And that was in the Taliban leaders' compound outside of Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. Um, we sent some special forces in there in their CH-47s and took down Mullah Omar's compound. We knew going in there that there wouldn't be uh, people there that would be of interest to us. And we knew that there probably they wouldn't be dumb enough to leave things behind that would be interesting to us. But we wanted to make a statement to the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda and, and for the world that this was going to be a little different and that it's not going to be cruise missiles. It's, we're, going to, we're going to put at risk America's blood and treasure in this effort. Um, it, was, it was amazing as a sidelight with our unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles with infrared cameras at night, you could sit in the Pentagon, as I did, and watch this operation go down. You could watch the Chinooks come in. You could see the dust being blown up by their rotor wash. You could see the troops get out. You could see them put their breaching charges on the walls. You could see the holes blown in the walls. You could see a lot of scurrying around. Uh, the injuries we had were from blasts from our own charges that injured a, a couple of people, and we damaged uh, one helicopter to the point that it had to be repaired later on. It, it had a hard landing in that, that dust as you lose your horizon. Um, but it was a, an attempt to show people that this, is a, that this offense is going to be a different kind of offense. But the strategy is not complete there. Um, that's, in my view, all short term. 
there's got to be a much longer term component to our strategy which is not yet fully developed and certainly not fully implemented. When I say ours, it's not the U.S. It's, it's got to be the international community that thinks about this threat that I just described because they've, they've had the same threat in Europe and, well, most places in the world, Middle East, everywhere, um, uh, and Asia, Asia Pacific. And that is, how do you get to an environment where men and women uh, don't feel compelled to join jihad? Today's Friday, uh, in many mosques around the world, uh, the preaching of hatred, hatred towards the West, is, uh, is going on as we're sitting here. And uh, the education in many of these places is, is not teaching people how to uh, become citizens of our new global environment, but it's, again, teaching hate. And it's going to take decades to work our way through this. Like anything, like the Cold War or whatever it is, you need a strategy for this. There are the beginnings of a strategy. In fact, the military uh, wrote a strategy for this, our piece of it, uh, in our government trying to get the rest of government to come together with a strategy and then getting consensus or letting other people in the international community help us with this strategy is, is the trick. If you don't do that, it's going to be like, um, I will insult you unless you've got really young children. And as a grandfather, I didn't, by the way, I didn't think a former chairman this week would be crawling up inside the playground equipment at McDonald's trying to retrieve my grandson who got stuck up there, but I did. It's not a distinguished move for you folks that have been to McDonald's um, because it's a little small place and a lot of your body parts show when they shouldn't anyway. Uh, anybody's been to Chuck E. Cheese, they have this machine, the, uh, whack, the whack-a-mole machine. I don't go to Chuck E. Cheese. I mean, you only go there because your kids want to go there and play on this stuff, right? But uh, because the food's terrible. But they have uh, <laughs> this whack-a-mole machine, these little moles, and you sit there and you whack on them, right? Well, in a sense, um, the strategy today, and it's a lot, obviously a lot more sophisticated than this, but, you know, we're going to be in this game of whacking terrorists on the head <clears throat> for a long time unless we get to the long-term strategy, which is get behind that machine and change the algorithms to control when these things pop up. And that's going to take, it's going to take a new way of thinking about our business uh, that we haven't been, been through yet. And um, there's, been some, there's been some papers published. The White House has put out a strategy on this. I think we're at the beginning stages of that and understanding what this is all about. But it's a, much more about um, um, economics and diplomacy than it is about military issues. The military will play a role, of course, but it's, it's going to be subordinate. But in the near term, the military, of course, is playing a playing a huge role. Um, what's it going to take to win? So if that's the threat, a little bit about the strategy, what's it going to take to win? Uh, I used to say all it really takes to win is patience and will and resolve. And I've modified that to say um, we need good, honest, uh, bipartisan debate. Patience is obvious because if we're in a, if we're in a decades-long conflict with violent extremists who would do away with our way of life, then we've got to be patient in seeing that through. And that's just going to be, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be like the Cold War. So get ready for four or five decades of that kind of work and thought and, and, uh, and execution. Um, will and resolve because the adversary is counting on our, on our lack of will and resolve. So that always plays in this. I mean, that's what they, they count on. And they must love a lot of the public debate they watch in this country because it can be very fractious. And the last part I talked about was um, good open debate on these very serious issues. I know you had some right before lunch on uh, NSA and, and uh, different techniques that they might use in the war on terrorism. Um, we could talk about detainees. I mean, there's lots of uh, how you handle detainees. Uh, lots of good debate about issues about 21st century security, and you're, we're still trapped in the 20th century bureaucracy and body of law and systems that maybe are appropriate or maybe aren't, but we haven't had the debate to, to come to a conclusion in, in our own mind. But if you're going to have that debate, then you need, you, need a, you need a media, I guess you're going to have a session this afternoon, a media uh, that has uh, perspective as they go after these problems. And um, I'd be happy to answer some media questions. I've got, some, I've got a lot of experience. I know a lot of great reporters. I know some not so great. And, um, and, I, and, and some of the things I know are, um, are not good for our democracy. 
It's just not, we're just not getting the depth and breadth we need to be informed citizens. Now, you're a little different group, uh, so you're probably not relying on um, everything you read for your information, but it, this, is a, this is an issue that requires a lot of thought, and I know you're devoting an afternoon, or at least a part of an afternoon to it, and that's, that's good. Uh, just, uh, so that's what it takes to win. A uh, question about U.S. troops. Um, one of the things I did before I retired in August was uh, go on a, a, a troop visit. And I did it because, I, first of all, it's fun. It gets you out of Washington, D.C. It gets you out of the Pentagon. And when the chairman says he'd like to go around the world and visit troops, they show up with airplanes and people, and <laughs> they make it pretty darn painless. Um, so for, for 10 days, we went 25,000 miles. We made about 18 different stops. Um, saw 15,000 troops, and uh, of course, they don't just want to see the chairman. In fact, they probably don't want to see me very much at all, but I always take a little bait along. We went to the USO. We got some great entertainers. We got uh, two great comedians. Um, we got a, a young lady that is a friend of mine that is uh, on TV that does uh, some sports shows, and uh, she was the MC. And then we were looking for a sports figure, and we wanted to get an active sports figure. Try to find an active sports figure in August. Tell me the sport that is, isn't doing something in August because we couldn't find one. So we went to the NFL Hall of Fame, found Gail Sayers. I don't know if anybody knows Gail or remember Gail Sayers, but uh, terrific running back. And when it was all said and done, after we all paraded across 18 stages and talked to 15,000 troops, the person that consistently got the, the standing ovation or would have tears in their eyes because of uh, the message would be Gail Sayers. The comedians were funny and they'd die laughing over the comedians, of course, but. Uh, and they're probably afraid of me, but they, um, well, not really, but uh, <laughs> wary anyway. Um, but Gail had a, had a message, uh, uh, and, and Gail wasn't sure. He was a little bit worried about this, too. He says, we're going to Iraq? I said, yep. He says, is that going to be safe? And she says, it's going to be as safe as it, as it can be, um, which is fairly safe, you know, <laughs> fairly safe. Um, I will tell you one, I, I didn't want to deviate, but this anecdote is so good. How many have been on board a carrier? Okay, a lot of you. And how have you gone on board a carrier? Have you gone, have you gone on CODs? How many are COD, COD? Okay. So for those that haven't gone on a COD, let's see if this description is right. It's a long cylindrical device that makes a lot of noise. They put you inside it, they strap you in backwards. You have no windows. There are a couple, but you're not sitting by one normally. And then they beat on the side with hammers and make it real noisy. And it ends with uh, landing on the carrier where you're, it's a nice tug because you're facing the right direction. The catapult shot is the interesting piece. And that's my story about Gail Sayers. So Gail survives all this in the landing and we're down doing our thing in the hangar bay and it's time to leave. And we all get strapped in. And they tell you when you strap in that if you don't strap in right, since you're gonna accelerate from zero to 140 miles an hour in about two and a half seconds, that, that uh, your face is gonna implant on the seat in front of you, which would probably rearrange your nose. So please everybody strap in, well, hold on. And it's, it's kind of noisy, and there's some clanking noise going on as they're attaching the shoe to the nose gear and all that. And then there's the cat shot, which is noisy. And then all of a sudden, it's relatively and comparatively very quiet. It gets quiet instantly. And I can still remember Gail Sayers, who was sitting right over here looking around at me, kind of like, is this it? Are we done? <laughs> and I gave him, I gave him a, a thumbs up, not knowing whether it was done or not. I just, but I didn't want him to die all ten up. I just said, we're okay, Gail. <laughs> And, and off we went. The troops, the troops get it. The troops understand the mission. Uh, they're dedicated to the mission, and they're making it happen. I think the military has probably been used disproportionately in, our, in terms of our instruments of national power in the current endeavors. And part of it is because in this new security environment, we require more of our other departments and agencies than they've ever had to produce before. And so now it's not just your armed forces going fighting your nation's war and the front lines are on the page for everybody to read. It's a very complex situation in Iraq. You've got a, an insurgency. Um, it takes different types of talents to fight this and not always is the military the best, the best talent. But we're thrown in there because others can't, can't or won't produce. Um, the military gets it. A story on this tour. I'm in Baghdad. A young lady comes up. She's in her Kevlar M16, and usually what I say when we're greeting and meeting people, thank you for your service, first thing I would say to them. She says, before I can say a word, she says, thank you for the opportunity to serve in Iraq. And I'm thinking, what's the next line going to be? And um, 
and she says, uh, I'm a National Guard person, 35 years old, and I had a nice job in civilian life, but I've never felt more valuable to this planet or what I'm doing than what I'm doing right now, and I thank you for the opportunity to serve over here. I'm not telling you that because in the standard distribution of uh, responses and complaints and stuff, that that's outside, you know, way out here on the ends of the bell curve. That's a standard deviation of the mean of everybody that I've ever talked to in this business. And, um, and I was taken aback. There was a Zogby poll about a month ago that I was confronted with cold before going on uh, to speak at the, uh, down at the University of Texas. And you later come to find out that the, the methods and the questions asked in the poll were probably a little bit slanted. As I'm told, I haven't seen the questions because they haven't revealed them. Um, but I've, anyway, so the, the troops, the troops aren't, aren't asking for anything except support at this point. So they're doing what their country is asking them to do, and they do it, I think, in a, in a remarkable way in many corners of this, in this globe. Um, the last thing before we go to questions. You know, you're always looking for, for good material for speeches and so forth, and I had a pretty good speech writing group. But uh, I found a quote that I just absolutely love. And uh, a lot of you historians will know this quote. I love it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I think it expresses something that's really, really important to us that we forget from time to time in, our, in the heated debates of the moment, although things like this, the heated debates here are good. From what I heard about your debate before lunch, that's exactly the right kind of debate we need. Um, and it's also by a uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And Dr. Cohn, if you can figure out who this is, when I'm, and you probably can. I mean, you sh if you can't, you, you're going to have to know it by the time you go to Carlisle. Uh, <laughs> here's how the quote. Freedom. No word was ever spoken that held out greater sacrifice. Needed more to be nurtured. Blessed more the giver. Damned more its destroyer. Or came closer to being God's will on earth. May America ever be its protector. And that's Omar Bradley, 1948, the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that, that pretty much sums it up. I thank you for your time, and let's go to some questions. Uh, being an airman, this being unnatural being in the brush. Uh, what I'd like to do is, again, we don't have the handheld mics. But if you would stand, identify yourself, and identify any affiliation that you have. And so. And you I'll, want me to stay here because of the mics, I assume. I, I, I would prefer that, sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am, first. I hate, hate podiums. Um, my name is Beth Berman. Hi, Beth. I live here in Durham. Sir, thank you for your service. For thank you. Country, and also for being willing to come speak to us and answer the question. You bet. Um, my question is we hear that. Our country is facing a threat like no other, and um, I'd like to know why that is so. That is, in the Second World War, um, we were attacked. True, it wasn't on the mainland. But other than the fact that we were attacked on the mainland, what makes this a more dangerous enemy? to us in our way of life than, say, Nazi Germany was. And then secondly, if it is such a tremendous threat, then why is there no comparable mobilization for right. that in the Second World right. War? There's not, there's not even, uh, there's not gas rationing. No sacrifice has been asked. So we hear this, and yet, um, it's, it's, it, that's, those are Those are great questions. Um, um, why, and, and let me just elaborate a little bit longer on why I think this is a dangerous threat. Uh, these are people that have said uh, they will uh, kill innocent men, women, and children to achieve their objectives. One of their objectives is to do away with our way of life. At least that's what they've said, and they've said it time and time again. As I said, UBL declared war on us in 1998, and you can say, well, uh, and then I said fear. And, and the reason I say fear is, um, Today, in, in, in Pearl Harbor days, you know, an attack was going to result, a single attack was going to result in maybe thousands of deaths, perhaps, maybe. Pearl Harbor was a little over 2,000. But in a future attack, with the weapons that are out there, and you think about nuclear or, uh, and, for, and I'll, let me talk about radiological 
not in the sense that it's going to create a lot of death, perhaps, or even injuries, although it probably would do a fair amount, but I'll talk about that just a little bit later, um, or biological. And so they, they will go to any lengths. They are not bound by any convention, by any law except their law. And they're willing to die for their cause. It's a religious-based cause, at least their form of Islam, and, it, and they're willing to die for it. it is, it's what Israel puts up with every day. And it is, uh, it's, it's just, I think it's extremely, extremely dangerous. Why did I mention radiological? Um, you wouldn't have to have a nuclear uh, yield, a detonation in this country to create the kind of fear I was talking about. All you'd have to have is somebody that got, got, got a radiological device detonated in a major city, and then for the next couple of decades, while this territory is cooling down and becomes um, habitable by humans again, you have this fence around it that says, a do not, warning, do not enter a nuclear hazard. And on your way to work every day, you'd look at that and say, gee, I wonder where the next one's coming from. I mean, how would it affect your mind, your optimism, your hope, your spirit, all that sort of thing. So it plays on a, it's, it's, it's not World War II. It is a much more complex mechanism. And one of the things that has been frustrating is how do you describe this? And nobody, and as you said, the people that are sacrificing you know, are those that are in the military or State Department or other, form, or other uh, departments and agencies of government that go serve somewhere, uh, go in harm's way. But for the most part, the American people aren't sacrificing much. And how do you, how do you, how do you change that? And um, I, I don't know, I mean, I spoke one time to an editorial board, uh, the Phoenix Sun, and I, I said, you know, when we walk out of this building, it's going to be a glorious day here in Phoenix, and we're going to forget about where at war. You're going to look around, just like here on this wonderful campus. We're going to walk out of this Thomas Center, and we're going to say, pretty nice uh, afternoon. It's going to rain, maybe, but, you know, then that's pretty good. And, you know, and you contrast that with the people that went to polls in Iraq and Afghanistan who, who, who risked their lives to go to the polls, and, and we don't go if it's raining, or we don't go if we got a golf match. They risked their lives. They were in, in Bamiyan, in central Afghanistan, about not one of the two recent elections, but it goes back about a year and a half. The women of Bamiyan province were told, if you go vote, we will kill you. And they said this is a pretty serious threat because just the other day, a minibus, you probably read about this, a minibus um, with people on a stop by the Taliban, those that had voter registration cards were brought off and shot, killed. So the women of Bamiyan province said, wait a minute, <clears throat> we've been waiting a long time for this. And so they dressed appropriately. They dressed in the garb and bathed as they would as if they were going to go die or be buried. And then they went to vote. So it, it is different. And we are, we are untouched by it in, in ways that, um, and we haven't been able to make up the difference. And, we, and, and it goes on and on, but it, just explaining measures of, of merit and success are very, very difficult in this war. We've tried many different ways, and we're, un, we're unsuccessful. I'm, and I, w I wish I had an answer for that. I wish I did. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric Doggett from Atlanta. Eric. Uh, two things. First, um, you alluded to some I guess, frustrations with respect to broad breadth of uh, coverage from a media perspective of a balanced picture. I appreciate a little bit of elaboration on that. And just the other comment is we've been debating our rights, civil rights, constitutional rights, and everything. And uh, just uh, you have an opportunity to meet with other uh, servicemen so know that we appreciate that it's the blood, sweat, fear, the sacrifices they're making that converts that those words on that piece of paper into our rights. Thank you for that. And if you, uh, and this is not an advertisement, but it's, it is important because I think uh, as opposed to Vietnam, where when I got back to San Francisco International Airport, they, uh, and we're going down to the, or uh, actually got into Travis Air Force Base, going down to San Francisco Airport, they said, uh, this was in 1970, said, would you, you better change out of that uniform if you don't want to get hassled on the way to and through the airport. And I said, what's that about? Because I've been overseas doing, what you, well, there's big protesters and blah, blah, blah. A little different today. I think people understand the people that make policy and those that are obligated by our Constitution to carry out policy are two different things. So I, I appreciate those sentiments. Uh, if you want to go to America Supports You, all one word, uh, dot mil, uh, it's a website where it shows what people are doing to support uh, uh, the troops. And uh, it gives you ideas, or maybe you can join things that would be supportive, and you're probably already doing that. But, but that's all the troops need to know, is that America supports them, and then they'll do whatever uh, their commander-in-chief or uh, the country asks. 
On the other issue of the media, it, it's depth and perspective. It's, it's depth and perspective that are lacking in, in many of the things we see today. Um, I went down to a what the Navy calls, we got some Navy officers in here, wedding down party. You would understand a wedding down party. So uh, for my former public affairs officer, uh, now Admiral Frank Thorpe, and there, there were a lot of media and a lot of the folks that I worked with the last five years, six years, maybe even longer. I heard three stories that were disturbing that night. One was a um, cable news uh, personality that if I told you his name, you'd recognize it right away. And I said, how you doing? He says, all right, we got talking for a while. And he said, you know, I said, how's, how's the job going? He says, well, you know, the truth is the only reason I stay in the job is because they pay me this outrageous salary. I said, what are you talking about? He says, it used to be that they would call when there was a national security story breaking and they would ask my advice, since I'm the guy here in Washington, should we run this, should we not run it? And then they would ask me for context. He said, they don't do that anymore. They just, they'll run the story and sometimes I get asked for context, sometimes I don't. So in his view, he said, this was not what I was taught in journalism school. So that's the conversation I had with this one guy, the best I can recall it. Um, another person uh, wrote for one of the, uh, a newspaper you would all know. And uh, in fact, I better, um, to protect the innocent, I think I'll skip that story. Let me go to the, let me, let me. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, he, he, what, he, what he eventually said was, um, this particular newspaper is worried about column inches on the front page. They don't care how long the article is. They want to grab the headline. I, that, those are my words. He didn't say, they just column inches on the front page. He says, I can't explore issues the way I want to explore them. Uh, the final was somebody that traveled with me on this USO tour. Uh, and one of the reporters that I respect the most. And while I'm taking the pulse of the troops in my line, talking to as many troops of those 15,000 as I can talk to and shaking hands and doing all that business, he's on the other side of the room, hangar, wherever we were, field, talking as well. And then on the way home on the airplane, we got together and we compared notes. And I said, he said, how do you think troops are doing? I said, I think they're doing really well. I think morale's high, they, got, they understand the mission, they're well motivated, they seem to have the resources they need. Um, I think they're doing pretty well. He says, so do I. He says, I'm going to write a couple of stories about this. He says, you know, the hardest thing about this is getting it past my editors because they're not going to believe it. And now this is a long-term, highly respected writer. Well, if those are the constraints to getting depth and breadth and, and perspective on a, on a subject, then uh, we're in a sorry state in this democracy. We, we count on... <laughs> on the media and good journalism. And um, I, I worry about it. I worry, so those are my, those are some, a little more into this. Okay, Peter and then Dick. Peter? I've got more, but those are, and I'm not anti-media. I'm, I'm, I, I have some very professional colleagues that I respect and talk to and work with. And, uh, and you may have seen my name associated with a outfit here one of these days, you know, because you do have to earn a living, but I mean, it's, <laughs> so I'm, but I, but I do think depth and breadth is an issue, and I don't know that the competitiveness of today allows that to happen is the way it should, and um, some organizations are better than others. The only friends I have who served in Iraq and come back here the same frustration. So it's, uh, and it's not just telling the good stories, just give us some depth and breadth. First, as they ran a, they, just, just a little aside, they, there was an article, I didn't see it, I saw parts of it. Um, about Guantanamo, something about releasing the list, and, and of course the picture, the, the picture they release is of an, a closed camp. It was the, one of the first camps open down there, and it shows detainees in their orange jumpsuits uh, on their knees. This one goes back four or five years, four years. That's the picture they ran. That camp was closed three years ago, and we, you know, they're, they're making more th than a statement with that. I, that's just bad journalism, and it's, it's, we should be ashamed of ourselves. It's, it's too important. We get our information that way. That's what, how the Republic works. Peter? Peter Ravenhans from North Washington Law School. Uh, we've read a lot recently, an increasing number of articles about a preemptive strike against Iran. And assuming the administration decides to do that, and assuming maybe optimistically that they seek some sort of authorization from Congress first, what questions should Congress ask? <laughs> well, I'd be presumptive to, presumptive to, um, I mean, the, the basic question you always have to ask when you use force uh, is where is this going to lead and how do we know when it's going to be over? I mean, those are the questions 
you need to ask. Um, I've read, I have not read all of those articles. I don't know which one you're referring to. I was asked about one today on a, on a news program, uh, and I used the term ludicrous because um, the logic and debate that was, I hadn't read the article, so I could, I guess I could say that. It sounds ludicrous to me. Um, I, and I'm out of the administration. I don't have a clue what's being debated. I, I do know that any time you, you think about a national security issue or an issue that has to do with your national interest, that you've got to consider all your instruments of national power, which the military is one. So my guess is that people are making sure they have the planning. Sometimes the planning, well, quite often the planning is going to tell you about the feasibility, whether something's feasible or not feasible, and what the risk is. And so people can make decisions based on that. But, uh, but the end state is, a, is probably the most important question to ask. You know, what's, what's our objective in doing this, and what's our end state? And, um, and what's the estimate of blood and treasure it's going to take to, to do whatever it is we think we're going to do? Would be the would be the major questions I'd ask. Right. Uh, one last question, Professor. Uh oh. You know me, I'm Dick Cole, from the University of North Carolina, and I want to return to Herman's question, and I uh, offer an answer for your reaction. Um, the reason it's so difficult to explain this to the American people is because we have framed it as a war and we continue to do so. And a war implies that the Department of Defense should be in charge. A war implies that there'll be a victory or a defeat. A war implies that there will be a limited time. A war implies that there will be mobilization. A war implies that we will suspend some of our liberties for a limited period of time. Uh, a war implies many things that at the same time the administration and you and others have said are not going to be the case here. Right. So I think the problem of explaining something to the American people is, is that when you misframe it, they don't quite believe it. And I think uh, Professor Cohn and I agree on this. Uh, and I have spoken on this very topic. I got a little ahead of my headlights probably because I was trying to lay some groundwork, I thought, maybe intellectually through when I was in uniform to talk to several audience about why do we call it a war because it's it's more it's it's different than that and that does imply that the military is your primary instrument of national power when as you heard, heard, at least heard me describe what I think the strategy would encompass would be a lot more and not primarily for the long war the uh, the military and um, and I talked to Secretary Rumsfeld about this uh, he agreed and uh, the two of us took it to the president. And uh, initially, uh, folks were um, thought it had some merit. We got some traction for a while. And uh, I'm not saying it was just me. I mean, it was, but we, we got some traction for a while. And uh, then it was decided, no, people understand the war on terrorism. And I, it, there's just, we would confuse the public or whatever if we, if we change now this many years into it. So that was, it was a decision at, at the political level. But I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's, it's harder to explain if you think this is traditional warfare, where you can pick up the paper and say, well, there's the front line move, we're winning. You can't do it. We don't even have a good measure of merit uh, for explaining either progress or lack of progress in Iraq. It's very complex. It's an insurgency. We know it's going to take eight to nine years. That's the average and the insurgencies that we are familiar with. Um, we, we, we kept body count from being the measure of merit, and I think we've done a decent job of that. And there's been, I mean, they keep reattacking on that, at least when I was in office. They said, well, oh, we sure got to tell the folks how we're doing against the enemy. I said, well, no, we're not going to put numbers there. We're just, that's just gets in, then you start measuring the wrong stuff and you start chasing the wrong thing. It's much more complex than that. And we haven't found a way to do that with bumper stickers or with the sound bites that you have to deal in today, we we just can't do it. We have metrics. We have we have uh, at the uh, behest of the Department of Defense and the Joint Staff primarily, but embraced by the Secretary and then embraced by Dr. Rice when she was the National Security Advisor and later on the Secretary of State and and now uh, uh, Dr. Hadley or Steve Hadley. We have um, there's a the state has there's a strategic 
plan for a rock. There are metrics for all the various uh, goals and objectives, and we measure that. Uh, the problem is a lot of departments and agencies don't measure things very well or don't even think that's a good way to, to, uh, to manage. Uh, we happen to think that's, a, you know, you've got to know what the goal is and, and you've got to measure how you're doing against that goal so you know if you need to apply more resources, change your goal, or whatever it is. Um, we, it's been slow getting buy-in, but we have that. It is complex to, ex to explain it. I mean, this, this doesn't give way to... to uh, to simple explanations or bumper stickers. So it is that we thought about this, and, and people a lot smarter than me have tried to figure out, okay, how do we explain this whole issue to people in ways that will resonate, they'll understand? Because life is going to go on here. In five minutes when we're all out of this room, life's going to go on. And yet I would say we're just one attack to, one, one ta attack away from, uh, could be pretty dire consequences. And if you don't think they're out there planning and plotting right now, and that they would blow your kids or grandkids up and laugh and smile about it, then you're wrong, because they will. And that's the danger, and that's what I learned in four years, and, I, and, and I'm not dissuaded that that's not the case today. And so we have this dichotomy, this very dangerous threat, and yet for most of us, life goes on. And uh, it's probably always been that way. But I thank you for your attention. I think this conference is important. I, I thank you for what you're doing down here. One of the most important things we can do about this whole business, whatever aspect you want to talk about, is debate it. And we need more of that and not less, and we need uh, more bipartisan debate or less partisan debate where we can discuss the facts in, in an open way, and, and then we'll make some real progress around here. Anyway, thank you very much. Let me just suggest that, that General Myers, by his very presence here today, uh, indicates how strongly he feels in this debate. But I would ask that we have one more round of applause, sir, for your service to your country.